Hello friends, this is Carter, and welcome to this episode of Making It Up, the conversation series where I sit down and talk with other writers. Some, sometimes I know the people, sometimes I don't, um, but I just want to get in and pick their brains and try to figure out why they chose to become a writer because it's a pretty horrible job uh, if you're looking to make a career out of it. So it's always fascinating uh, to hear their opinions, their peaks and their valleys. Uh, before we get to today's guest, just a reminder that my writing company Unbound Writer is now offering online courses. So um, go at your own pace. Uh, online courses, we have three available right now um, under the flagship Unbound Learning. You can just go to unboundwriter.com and check those out. Um, there are also spaces remaining for my October uh, 2024 writing retreat in Boulder, Colorado. And I also offer one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. So make sure to check all of that out at Unbound writer.com. Um, so today, today on the show, I had legendary thriller and mystery author, Lisa Gardner. So Lisa, I, I didn't know very well. I knew her a little bit. Um, we had, I think, met a few times over the years, and then we did an event together, an online event together um, earlier this year. And so I asked her to come on the show. And, um, you know, if you've probably heard of Lisa, if you certainly if you're a suspense reader, you've heard of Lisa, she's a number one New York Times bestselling author. Um, her most recent release out of 30 plus releases is I Still See You Everywhere, which is uh, uh, is a great title. I love that title. Um, but yeah, we it, it was one of these conversations where we didn't even get into kind of her journey as a writer. It very much started talking immediately about craft um, and about the writing process, and it just never veered away from that. So it was 40 minutes of just kind of comparing notes as writers, and it was really interesting to hear her methodology. We are similar in that um, we are both uh, pantsers. We do not outline our books, and we try to write from a place of, um, of emotion and really character-driven stories rather than plot-driven stories. So it was interesting to, to talk about all of those things. And, um, you know, we also talked about just because she is so prolific, I was curious um, about you know, do you ever feel like you're repeating yourself, that your characters are getting into the same kind of situations over and over again to a point where you're feeling like you're not being original to the degree that you really strive to be? Um, or do you have crutches that you are introducing into every book that you're not even realizing until somebody points it out to you? So it was that kind of conversation. It was really interesting to hear some of the things that she says, though she had some really good answers for, for a lot of it. And at the end, we made up a really uh, compelling, uh, creepy-ass story um, about a person stranded in the water using a sentence from Darcy Coates' uh, beautiful novel, from below. So it was a very fun conversation. I think you're going to love this one. This is uh, my chat with Lisa Gardner. How are you? I'm well. Are you getting ready? Are you going to Boutricon in a couple days? No, no. I'm going to try to deliver a book. If you know who did it, I'm taking all options at this point. <laughs> Was, uh, the one you're least likely to expect. <laughs> I, I was down to the butler and Colonel Mustard. <laughs> that's kind of the level I'm at at this point. <laughs> as long as you don't force it. I mean, that's what I hate is I couldn't. Well, first of all, like there's always the idea of like if you're writing maybe a thriller, it's not so important the who did it. It's the the story itself as opposed to a mystery. Um, but I hate when you're like not trying to write a mystery and then people are reviewing it and saying, oh, I guess like. 20% in. I'm like, I told you who yeah. it was. 20%. Yeah, really. in. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the point of the story. Um, well, that's, it's nice to maybe not go to a conference and to save a little time and money. It's, uh, <laughs> it's fun, but I, I'm going to be there, but just for two quick days. And it's, uh, it's a bit of a whirlwind always. And I'm always happy to get home. Where is it this year? Uh, it is in Nashville. Oh so. yeah. That'll be fun. Yeah, they just had Killer at Nashville, I think, like yeah. last week. And, um, oh, goodness. VoucherCon. But um, yeah, exactly. When is your book due? Um, September 5th. 
<laughs> so you're, uh, yeah, it's like you're pregnant and you're like, you're just staring down that delivery date and thinking of all the things you got to get done before that happens. <laughs> At this point, I'm like, pop out, pop out. Okay. <laughs> right. so, yeah. Done. done but, over it. <laughs> what um, book number is that for you? Oh, I have no idea. Or have you lost count? Something. Yeah, I actually really don't pay attention. It's one of those questions I get asked, I can never answer. Yeah, I mean, I know my published books, but when you talk about total books, <laughs> sure, yeah. or or books that have started and kind of morphed into something mm -hmm. else, or books that you've, I mean, I have a book that I completely gutted to the extent that I consider it two books because I pretty okay. much rewrote and, and, and it still didn't, my first three didn't sell. Um, so it's an interesting yeah, so question then. Yeah. Like how do you count that? Like what are the parameters? Right. It's all practice. Um, <laughs> eventually. And even like the first published ones are still, you, you go back and look at those and you're like, huh, I've not that they were bad necessarily, but you've, you change as a writer. And yeah. I was having this discussion the other day and I think it was probably my fourth, maybe my fifth published book where I felt like, Oh, that's, that's my voice. I didn't, yeah. I, I never really understood this whole finding your voice yeah. until it happens. And to me, it was like finding the, the tense and the point of view that just seemed to flow most naturally out of me. I'm like, maybe that's my voice. I don't know. Well, see, and I've changed that up over the years, but I've got 30 years now. I mean, right. you, you kind of got to change some things up for. Right, <laughs> right. Well, it, <laughs> yeah, and it's not even so much that I'm curious with you is if that if those changes over time are kind of a reaction to your readers, to the market, or it's just like, I want to do something different. I don't necessarily want to switch genres. I don't not yeah. necessarily want to switch names, which sometimes those thoughts cross my mind, but mm -hmm. I want to write from the point of view of somebody I've never done before. Yeah. I find I get restless. It seems like every seven, eight books, I'm ready to try something new. So, you know, with thrillers, I started out classic third person, FBI profiler, serial killer, murder and mayhem. Lots of, you always know who did it. The serial killer. That would be your right. first hint. <laughs> right. You know, kind of thing. And then I just came up, read some ideas, certain crimes where it's like, this would work better as a police procedural. And I'd never actually done a detective, a local right. cop book. So that's kind of fun. And more research. Then I, <laughs> yeah. Then I got into Flora Dane, who's like a vigilante. And now I'm writing the Frankie Elkin books, which is an average person. And it's a little bit more maybe amateur sleuth because she could be right. us. And it's first person, present tense. Yeah. Um, some people are little, the kind of amateur sleuth this, but the kind of pretty violent. It's like, well, I didn't totally give up my roots. I mean, right, right, <laughs> right. You're kind of, you're kind of cherry picking the best of, of what you've done. And it is a little bit like you write different, you know, so I, I don't write series. I only write standalones. Yeah. But so I can imagine writing series, you, you get to a point where you're like, yeah, I'm ready to move on from this universe. Um, yeah. But for me, when I switched to first person, present tense, female point of view. Yeah. And that was the only point of view for the entire book. I'm like, this just is flowing out of me, like whatever it is. And so now that's my preferred method of writing because it's just, yeah. I don't know, it's just easier somehow because you can kind of disconnect from you, the author, and yeah. inhabit somebody totally differently. Yes, totally. And so, you know, when I first started with the Frankie Elkin books, because it's always Frankie's point of view, and it was refreshing, like you said, and easier, because it's almost like you stepped into, it was like method acting, kind of, so to speak, you're just going to get totally. out and be Frankie today. But four books later, Frankie and I are fighting a lot this book, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I'm kind of like, I just want a good crime scene with a, where I can bring in a detective. And right, right. You know, I know, I know. But and and, it, and that, that's a really great analogy, method acting, because it's true. Yes. You know, you get asked that question, or at least I get asked the question, yeah, yeah, are you just thinking about your books all day long? I'm like, no. But when I sit down and I reread the last half a page, I'm like, all right, this is the world. This is who I am. Yeah. And I can just get into that for yeah. an hour. I only write an hour a day and then I pop out of it. And I don't think that much about my books as I go about my day. I, or is, is it for you? Is it all encompassing or is it, uh, you, you know, you have your time to, to, to Every write. Every now and then I'll get into a groove 
And, yeah. and it's nice when you do where for whatever reason, like, you know, the middle of the night, I'm waking up with thoughts. You know, I loved hearing you describe when we did that panel together that you write an hour a day because it gave me hope because I feel <laughs> like, well, you know, it's interesting when you first start out as a novelist, you have a real job. At least I did. In fact, I had right. two for a while because, you know, you're not making money off the writing. So you are wedging it in. It's like you got right. an hour to write. Right. And then if things go well and you reach a point where you not only publish, but you're self-supporting. There's this brief euphoria where it's like, I've got all the time in the world to write. <laughs> Except if you hit that point, then the next thing you know, there's all the other career stuff. It's conferences, right. it's right. social media, it's yeah. visits it's to New York, it's, it's talks, it's panels. And, and, and the next thing you know, it's like, you know what? I have one hour to write a day. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, I know. It's come full circle. <laughs> I know it, totally. You're absolutely right. And it's, it is all consuming. And I don't think a lot of people kind of realize that. And there's always a question of like, well, how much should I be doing? Because you can't do everything. Um, yeah. And you can obviously, when you get to a position where you can, you can hire some people to help you out with things that are, they're going to be better at doing for you than you yeah. will yourself. But yeah, I, I, I left my day job just last year, but then I started my own company within that old day job kind of industry. Okay. And I started yeah. a writing company doing online classes and retreats and one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I'm like, I'm busier now. So I'm, yeah. I'm to your point, I'm only just still only writing the hour a day. And <laughs> I feel like now that's really all I have, even though I thought I would have all this more time, but it's, and it's hard to write more for me. Like you, it's a muscle, right? Like there's yeah. people who say I sit and I write seven hours a day. I can, I can, envision that but that's something you have to work up to that's like your brain it's like you can't work out seven hours a day <laughs> if yeah. you're used to working out 30 minutes you know the gym is actually is always the analogy i use for mm -hmm. writing it is like getting too, yeah you establish a regiment and it's really hard like when you've taken a break for anything and you got to get back into it but then you know, strict to stick to a schedule, whatever works for you, the hour a day, seven days a week, three, eight hour days. I mean, just whatever it is, but create that pattern, get that pattern going. And right. your life is so much easier. It's when I start traveling a lot, because think about all the international releases and now yeah. you're in France doing something and this doing something. Um, I, I feel like I come back to my project. My that's really my current Frankie book is kind of separate from this. I've been like, uh Oh, like, I have no idea. <laughs> and then I right. read the pages. I'm like, this is good. I wonder what happens next. And then you hit the blank spot and you're like, damn, right. it does happen next. Totally. <laughs> it's a me <meat> problem. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, you're right. Is And I always, I, I always thought working out was a great analogy. And that's what I, it's so interesting talking to, I guess, aspiring writers, struggling writers. And yeah. what you'll, what you see in, in, in these people is, these fits and bursts that they go through yeah. that they'll have these amazing muse filled moments of eight hours of yeah. writing and they won't touch it for two months. And that's like going and like running a marathon when you're not yeah. ready to, and then being dead for two months after that. I mean, <laughs> you have to struggle, you have to build the muscle and, and people are amazed when, when you say you write an hour a day, but you can write a book in eight to yeah. nine months. Um, yeah. And that's like a light, for a lot of people because like okay an hour i can manage i mean even if it's 15 minutes to your point creating that subconscious routine of like i'm sitting here i'm ready to go and maybe nothing comes but i've i've placed myself in a place to succeed whether or not it happens so i mean i have plenty of days where i just sit there i'm like i i don't know because <laughs> i don't Sometimes know you have I, to write poorly to write well you know the right. other thing i wish i'd realized this sooner is that all parts of the book don't write at the same pace for me. Like no. I don't plot. So the first hundred pages for me are slow. Cause it's like, I mean, it's terribly inefficient. It's like, I build a wall one day and the next day I'm like, oh no, no, it needs to be over there. And I put the wall there. And then the next day it's like, yeah. actually I liked it better the first place. I mean, it's terribly inefficient, but like now where I'm reaching, you know, the climatic end of this book, all the plot stories are coming together or now we're into action and everything's happening at once, of course, and high drama that to me, like that writes fast. 
Like, yeah. Thank goodness. Like, right. You know, you, <laughs> right. And that's your subconscious bringing that all yeah. together because I don't plot either. And I've tried yeah. and I just, yeah. I just can't like, I immediately think of something different and I'm like, all right, I throw the plot away because I found something more interesting. I think the first hundred pages for me go by fast because I don't know what I'm doing and I'm just throwing everything at my protagonist. Like, what are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with this? Yeah. And then after hundred pages, I'm like, none of this makes sense. Now I got to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> but I had so much fun, like just torturing yeah. this poor person. And like, you know, and then I'm like, all right, I've written myself into a corner. But then the last hundred usually goes pretty fast too. Uh, what are your favorite moments when you're writing? Do you have like, like those moments where since you're not outlining, you're like, oh my God, this just occurred to me. And that was probably percolating the entire time. And I hadn't realized it. What are, I, what are those moments for you? I love the aha moments. Mm. I'll, I'll be honest, 30 some books later, the craft part of this to me never gets easier. It's the other yeah. thing I wish I had realized sooner. I guess apparently we are supposed to suffer again and again and again. <laughs> but, Perpetual but, homework. <laughs> yes. But there is this real magic. With the, like, I mean, I didn't know how this book kind of writing for next year was wrapping up and I was getting to the point really a couple of weeks ago where it's like, uh, I kind of have to know now, like it was yeah. been great for a while. And, and then one day, and, and it might've been, it was either probably whether I was hiking with the dogs or 4am the thought. And I was like, Oh, and then it was kind of like, Oh, like all of a sudden I know what all of this has been about. And I honestly have just spent nine months writing something and had no idea, but right. hell, it all works. Yay, thank right. goodness. You know, it all works. Totally. And in those <laughs> moments, you see like these connections between these characters, like, oh my God, all these characters have a fear of abandonment. And I didn't realize that, but that's yeah. what the story is about. And I didn't realize not only does my protagonist have it, but the three other characters have it as well to some degree. I'm like, that's so cool that that just happened. But... <laughs> So I don't know about you, but so I do torture my friends and family. So and still see you everywhere. It kind of becomes a big thing about there's some kind of code or there's something going on with Noodles the Cat, which for the record, I just threw in there one afternoon, probably because I didn't know what to write. Noodles the Cat sounded cool. So yeah, right. <laughs> fast forward six months later and you're like, oh, my God, Noodles the Cat has to mean something now. So everywhere I went, everyone I talked to, I'm like, Noodles the Cat, what does Noodles the Cat mean? And of course, they're all like, oh, she really has gone nuts. It was only a matter of time. But <laughs> right. periodically you get the person go well why would that be relevant why would you need to know that and that actually solved the puzzle the, yeah you know someone knew nothing at all just asking the right question right. Like, because and then it's like oh oh never mind i know noodles a cat i have to go now bye <laughs> <laughs> that's know? so funny yeah because you'll write something that you love and you will recognize once you've written enough whether it's kind of this disembodied yeah. thing that you're going to have to end up cutting and you just, but sometimes you write that thing and you're like, this is going to have to mean something because I really enjoy writing about noodles, the cat. And, and so it's the whole Chekhov gun thing. Like make sure you know what it's going to mean. Um, but it doesn't have to be in your face about it, but you know, you do recognize over what, after a while, like it does, it, it has to mean something. It is the weird thing. And what I like, of uh you know, the wisdom that comes from having spent, you know, my entire adult life doing this now is even if I don't know the answer, I know when I'm on the right track. I mean, right. that's the instinct you didn't have in the beginning. When you're a new right. writer, you, you really just have no context. You just, you don't really know what you're doing. Now it's something like noodles, the cat. I knew it mattered. I couldn't figure out why, but I knew it had to versus the other times you get to point. You're like, yeah, that you, that was just stupid. And you just need to cut that. Like it, it's right. not even relevant anymore. Right. And to at least have that kind of writing instinct to fall back on now, like, okay, I'm lost. I'm confused. I have no idea, but I still know I'm on the right track. Right. And just right. really that epiphany better happen fast though. <laughs> you know? And that only comes from years and years and years. I mean, and not only is it an instinct, it's a confidence, which you know, confidence and writers are, are two things that don't usually intermix very much. No, yeah, and exactly. and it's a long time before you get that confidence. But if there is that sense, so a great example for is like an editorial letter. Like you get yeah. these comments from your editor and it's always overwhelming. It doesn't ever get easier. Yeah. Um, and you look at it and you don't have the answer right away, but that sense of like, I don't know, but I'll figure it out. Um, yeah. That 
probably takes five full novels to get to a point of like yeah. that, the confidence of like, I don't know the answer, but I know I'm capable of coming up with something good. It's just going to take me a little bit of time. Um, and that's I all. am a big rewriter. I don't know about you, but generally oh, those of yeah. us who don't plot, it means we have to rewrite a lot. That's where the and magic comes in. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I argue all the time. I'm better rewriter than writer. Yeah. But one of the ways that's evolved my editorial process, because I do need a good editor. But yeah. sometimes you get notes and you're just like, I, I, I no, I, I don't actually don't think this is right at all, yeah. but I'll go back because so many people think of this as an adversarial system and it's not, you're like on the same team, you're trying to make this work. And totally. like, when you, you know, had all of these comments, go back to what was actually bothering you? Like, what are you trying to achieve here? And it might be, well, I just, you know, the pacing was kind of slow. And then I could step back and go, okay, the pacing was slow. Your comments actually, for the record, don't help with that at all. But now, now I have something that, that will. Right. <laughs> again, oh, and you have to know over time who to listen yeah, to. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when you first start out, you talk to everybody, like, can you read this? And then you get a thousand opinions and yeah. you can't obviously incorporate all of them. So it's, so, I, I find as I get older and the more and more books, I the people I show it to decreases over time. So yeah. eventually it's just like, my agent, my editor. <laughs> um, That's all I do. I yeah. think it's important. I actually think it's a real danger or it, it's, it's a challenge in this day and age. We all are getting so much input from social media. I mean, conferences. I feel like one of the worst things you can do for art and a book is art is to end up with, you know, a committee approach or you're trying right. to make everybody happy to me, almost by definition, you end up with a mediocre, you know, book by committee. When I first started out as a writer and I entered some writing conference uh, contests, you know, like you do. And I can't even remember, I think it was the first hundred pages thing. And, you know, I'm all like, I'm such a good writer. This is fun. And um, (laughs) no, it was, it was actually quite terrible. But when I got the score sheets back, as this in the day they did this, you know, it was like 10 judges. Well, I'm, we'll guess. And five of them actually gave the hundred pages a 10. But then five gave it a zero because they just make them so angry. Wow. <laughs> and I had an agent letter go later go, that's that's a sign of someone who's going to be successful. Because people yeah. either love it or hate it, but there's no medium. Right. <laughs> you <Right. know? laughs> yeah. If you look at the most successful books, they're not five star average reviews by any means. They're 3.6 because a lot of people hated the ending or whatever. But it, I think that boils down to like you called it art, which is 100% absolutely is. And if you're trying to write by committee or write to the market, I don't yeah. know where you're finding the joy. And if you're not finding the joy in the writing, yeah. I don't know how you do it because it's so fucking hard. <laughs> like yeah. it gets easier, but it never gets easy. And so if you're not writing, to, in my mind, for yourself, primarily like what entertained you as a pantser to like what happens today yeah. that's exciting and yeah it's going to be an ugly first draft but then the fun comes in how can i make this better how can my editor help me make this better and my agent yeah. um but that the well, joy has to be there well and if you think about it too i mean readers and we are still readers there's so many demands on our time and there's so many other things we can be doing it. I mean, a a mediocre book or a, Oh, I've seen this one coming or I'm not really engaged. Who wants to spend time on that at the end of the day? I mean, it's right. So to me, you need to write something that grabs someone's attention, the character or the plot or some aspect of it is so engaging. They're going to choose to do this. Right. Their free evening versus the 110 other entertainment options we all have now at any right. given time. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. Right. We're not competing with each other. We're competing with Netflix and for everything else, smartphones. Um, but yeah, I mean, and that's an interesting point. And I think it speaks to, and I'm curious to know your opinion on this about just, you know, a search for originality, which is something I, I kind of do maybe to a fault um you know and maybe that's why i only write standalones is because i love yeah. something different and my book coming out has qr codes that have videos in it so you can oh, watch the actress yeah. playing the character because i just is something different but do you ever feel you know having written and i feel this with even 10 published books so 30 yeah. plus books for you you know you're writing maybe the same character's voice for five books 
and you're like, oh, I know she said this before a hundred times, or I know, you know, this, this surprise element feels like I've done this before, even though I can't quite remember. Do you struggle with that at all? Feeling like you're Absolutely. repeating yourself? Yeah. And I actually feel like this last book has been one of the slowest or one of the books I've struggled the most with writing. And what I find is that's what I'm tripping up a lot. I go to do something and I'm like, okay, it's not, maybe Frankie hasn't done this in the course of that four book series, but I'm pretty sure Detective Dee Dee Warren did this like three times. hundred <laughs> percent. Right. Because you are still the, 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 the matriarch of all your universe of characters. So it's like, okay, not that then. And yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it adds, you know, again, we're talking about your writing with instinct, you're writing with joy, you're trying to let the book drive itself. But then there's these very real technical moments of, you know, we're all, products of our own psyche. We have our patterns we repeat in real life. Of course we would in our novels, but right. we shouldn't. Right. So you have to catch yourself. You have to like technically say, no, not that. And then I have to sulk and eat a lot of chocolate for a few days. And, right. You know, right. <laughs> right. and it depends on how major the, the repetition. I mean, I want to, you know, I have, we all have crutches and, and I have a yeah. crutch of a character, you know, taking a few beats of silence before answering or something like yeah. that. And I'm like, I write that so many times. I'm like, enough already. We get it. Um, but then there's major ones where you're just like, where maybe this, the a twist is very similar to previous. Or sometimes you write something that you don't even realize harkens to another book until your agent tells you like, did you do this on purpose? Cause this is just like book four or whatever. Like, mm. Oh, <laughs> I, I didn't even recognize that. I mean, let's just spill all our secrets here on podcast, but I, each book will have some kind of verbal thing. Like you were saying a couple beats of silence Yeah. that for whatever reason, I repeat through the entire novel, but it's original to that novel. I would like to point out. So like one of them, my editor friend was like, do you realize in every scene, someone is leaning against a door jam? <laughs> I don't even really know what leaning against a door jam is. And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm not actually sure even what leaning against right. the door jam is. Have you I ever, in fact, leaned it. against the door jam? <laughs> and, then, and she was right. Everyone was leaning against. I mean, I don't know why that was so in my head, but it's apparently if you were a character in this novel, you're required to lean against a door jam for at least so one funny. scene. It's <laughs> just in your why. head for some reason <laughs> for that one book. Uh, and I did the same thing for me with profanity. In fact, I, that's the only thing that I, out of curiosity, I, I'll go back and track. I'll do keyword ah, searches nice. for all the different words. And then I actually graph in Excel over a period of time. So you can see like the book and how many F words there were in it yeah. and how it's changed over time. And it's just, it's just fascinating to me. I'm like, boy, I say that a lot. Maybe I should, then I'll go back and be like, all right, I'm going to cut out 30 of these just because it's... <laughs> Especially on line two of the book, my head is like, you know, really. line two. I'm on page three. If we should, <laughs> right? No, it's, like it's Elmer Leonard novel at that point. <laughs> I know, I, but it's. Do you ever sit? Sometimes, like when I'm ready to start a new book, and and maybe this is more unique to standalones. I it'll just it, I won't have an idea for a book, but I'll have a mood. Uh, I'll be like, I need to write something angry because my last book was maybe kind of coming of age, still a thriller, but maybe gentle. And now I'm going to write something fierce and angry. And that's just my mood for the book. And then it just kind of comes out of me, but it's all driven from that, even not knowing what the book is about or who the characters really are. I find I seem to organically alternate between a book that's more mystery or more cerebral and then huh. the next book will be more action driven. Right. And it's like, Emotional. I think it's because every time I finish one of the cerebral books, I'm like, that was too hard. I will never do that again. Right. And the next book, we're just going to kill someone every chapter. <laughs> but then you feel kind of bad at the end of that. So you're like, I should do something more thoughtful. Right. <laughs> and around and around. <laughs> you know? And then it's interesting to see what people what devoted readers react to if they pick up on that. Um my last book was probably one of my most difficult because I did do something different and it did not resonate with my editor. And so there was a yeah. lot of rewrites and it was a, it was my COVID book. It was much more gentle. Yeah. Oh, that's was, hard. Yeah. You know, 1980s. And I kind of just fell in love with this character and I'm like, I don't really know what happens, but I want to just follow her around. And so yeah. to my editor's point, it needed a lot of, a lot of work. And so it was almost a two year process, which is a long oh. time for me. 
Um, yeah. And then the book after that, I'm like, I am going to write just something in your face, straightforward, no room to breathe. And, you know, and that resonates totally differently than the other one when you start kind of looking at what the what the overall reaction is. And it's, you know, you hope people just say, you know, it was different and I love it. And, the, you know, I'll still keep reading. The, but you never know. Sometimes you lose people because of that. I think if you're looking for the long haul, you're going to be a career novelist or you somehow found yourself in a spot where, oh my God, I've actually gotten away with it this long. I am a career novelist. <laughs> Whatever works for you. But right. At a certain point, you realize it's about having the body of work. It's right. having a portfolio. I have some books that I've written over the years that have been so intense, darkly violent. And there are readers who like find me at conferences to tell me that was the best thing they ever read. And I have other readers who are like, please never do that again. Um, then you have, right. you know, like ones that are more emotion driven. It's, you know, you think of Stephen King. Books are not all right. the same. We all have the different ones that are our favorite. Right. His dark, a, horror, dark horror is, you yeah. know, doesn't, he doesn't really do that that much anymore. Yeah. And maybe what we want as novelists or, you know, you've succeeded when someday you have people in a room debating which of Carter Wilson's or which of Lisa's books, you know, is their favorite because there's right. so many to choose from. Right. You know? Right. <laughs> but I, I, I look at it like I look at TV shows. Like I think some of my p favorite TV shows of all time were probably when I was 13 years old um, because I remember how they made me feel. If I watched those shows now, they'd be terrible. Um, they wouldn't hold up, but it's a reflection of who you were at that point in your life yeah. and how that emotionally resonated with you. And so I think about that with my books. That's what makes it easy to let go. Like, cause the hard thing yeah. to do as a writer is to let go and be like, no, no, I can make it better or whatever. And you're like, no, this was my best effort yeah. with the emotional cocoon I was in at the time that I wrote it <laughs> and whether or not I would still like reading that now, I don't know, but that's, it's, it's fair it's representation fun. of who I was. Yeah. Do you, um, and I always kind of think that emotion with thrillers in particular, emotion should really be. And also if you're doing first person present tense kind of at the top of what's coming off of the page rather than, you know, that's part of character development, but, but in, as opposed to plot, are you a writer who sits and looks at your characters and are constantly thinking like, how are they, how are they feeling right now? Yeah. So I'm definitely the character driven writer. And I think that's yeah. one of the reasons I've had to even swap up series over years. Cause there's only so much time you can spend in that intimate of a relationship with the character right. before right. you're like, okay, we need a break. It's not you. It's me. Just, right. We right. need a break. But, so I'm, Weirdly enough, it's, we're kind of back to our first point. I'm almost just inhabiting my character's shoes. I'm in their right. head. Right. And so the character part to me and the emotional drive and what are they actually looking for, trying to seeking in this book is the part to me that comes naturally. Because I think with thrillers, to your point, I mean, we all know, you know, a couple of people are going to die. A lot of people are going to run around and then you're going to catch the bad guy. The what isn't necessarily as compelling as you want to care who it matters to right, and what right. are the stakes and those right. moments where it does feel like all is lost or the, the character has to do something incredibly clever, right. incredibly um, courageous to save right. the day. That kind of hero's journey to me is still what we're looking for to come back to and a thriller as well as, you know, the good guys win. And so some of those archetypes really matter, but to make them really compelling you have to care about that person. If you're not in it for the protagonist, yeah. you're just kind of, you know, flipping page, pages. hundred percent. Right. Cause you're not going to care. And I think the two, I think the two traits, in my opinion, that drive successful books for the author are empathy and curiosity. So yeah. without that empathy, well without that, especially if you're doing POV first person, present tense, like you, if you're not an empathetic person, you're not going to pull that off um, because you have to be in, you know, in their shoes quite literally. Mm -hmm. um, and then the curiosity, I think, goes to being a pantser. You know, every chapter, you're like, well, what if, what if this happened? What would that mean? And there's times where I'm just like, let me just kill this guy because that just popped into my head. And maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. But it's when that when that curiosity comes about that's something I think I could never have figured out if were I sitting down trying to plot out the entire story. 
Now, I've loved writing the Frankie books because as characters go, because I mean, I came from FBI profilers and then a detective. Frankie is just so raw. She's yeah. a recovering alcoholic. She doesn't even have a place she calls home. She's broken and she's aware of it. I mean, she's very self-aware that everyone else seems to figure it out life. And it is still, she's a grown ass woman and it's a total mystery to her how people get through day by day, huh. but she's trying. And I think right. that does as readers, she's kind of refreshing. And, you know, it's like, if she can get up and muddle her way through this, well, then we, we should be able to do this too. Kind yeah. Of oh, that's really interesting. <laughs> I, I, I hadn't really thought about it until you just said that, but I do think because there's always the argument about your protagonist and should they be likable? And of course they don't yes. have to be likable. Um, but you want the reader to be rooting for them yeah. and, and you lose a lot of context of like, I have no idea if anyone's going to root for this yeah. character. This is just what's coming yeah. out of me. But I think to your point, you can have a, a protagonist that does some really stupid things, which makes books interesting, but if they're yeah. self-aware, like somebody who's completely uh, unaware of themselves is not an interesting, is not somebody you're going to root for because yeah. you're like, you're just an idiot. And, you know, <laughs> but if you're like, if you're failing despite all your efforts of awareness, yeah. that's kind of interesting. And you kind of end up rooting for them a little bit and it allows you to let your character fail a few times. And which Readers. I think is much more in interesting than succeeding. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting to me because I just did book tour back in March. Readers have almost a more personal connection to Frankie. I mean, it's like they um, love the detective. They love the FBI profiler, but more kind of like, you know, what a great character or Frankie feels to them more like, you know, their sister, their mother, a piece yeah. of themselves, the friend at the bar, the you know, the friend who are always trying to get good advice to so they could just get their life in order. Right. And I, I mean, and she's she's smart. She's not a screw up, but she's just she's, she she's every day figured this all. Yeah. She just right. still trying to figure this all out in her earnestness, her desire. She does want to be like everyone else. I mean, it seems like everyone else knows happy. Who doesn't want to be happy? Yeah. <laughs> seems like a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And that depends on readers' expectations. Cause like, yeah, you're and I'm much more I'm much more interested in writing somebody like Frankie than writing yeah. Yeah. somebody like James Bond who yeah. can't fail despite seven guns being pointed at us. Yes. <laughs> somehow and those he gets characters out of are it. fun too. But yeah, but they, like to your point, we gotta mix things are. up for us. Or right. our writing and, and the books get stale. So you kind of, uh, yeah, it is fun to get to move around and mess around. But I think, again, finding, like you said, the voice and that right character. Yeah. And I mean, again, it takes us nine to 12 months to write these things. I love it that readers, you know, by 6 a.m. have already read the new release that Amazon gave them at midnight. But I'm like, um, right. gonna have to wait a minute for the next one. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know. It's it, it's such a it, it, it's such a dissonant relationship, I think, between the writer and the reader. Like somebody will tell you like, oh, my God, I just I read this in one sitting. It's a great beach read. And I'm like, yeah. That took me a year and I cried when I wrote the ending. God damn it. <laughs> Don't you understand how I bled for this book? I know. And I think that gets, that gets harder when you become, in your case, as prolific as you are. You know, how do I, how do I keep readers expectations while maintaining my own sense of, I love doing this. I love these characters yes. having the same level of joy per book it's a hard thing to do. And I don't know if you've ever like, because now you, you know, your brand at this point. And so there are expectations yeah. attached to a Lisa Gardner book, right? Mm -hmm. Is, do you find yourself wanting to sometimes to completely subvert that and be like, I'm, or I want to write a different genre under a different name, just because I need to do this mentally. Have you gone through that phase at all? Or are you, you're, and, and I know you can do a lot of variety within what you're doing. Yeah. Um, but have you ever just wanted to just do something wildly different? Every now and then I've played around with it. I have the pet projects like any writer, but none of them came. I couldn't see them to fruition. I think you're kind of back to my voice at the end of the day fits. Interesting. Suspense. And I think as a reader, I've always liked a dark and stormy night right. and I've always loved mystery. And right. I've always loved that the sense of order you get, you know, from solving a crime, like this was right. chaotic, tragic, something right. terrible happened. And, you know, through the course of these, these characters, they made it right. They put this all together. So I keep coming back 
to suspense. But to your point, it's being the curious, the curiosity factor. Yeah. Each book, there's a new element. It might be in a, an aspect of law enforcement. Like when I did find her and we learned about um, the special agents in the FBI that actually work with, you know, long-term kidnapping victims, victim protagon- um, advocates to right now I'm writing a book about Afghan refugees in Tucson. Okay. I mean, right. okay. that's the element for me that's totally new, know nothing about. I have to learn and research. And that's, you know, that's kind of my candy for the next nine right. months. <laughs> and, and because you are your protagonist, it's all new to them as well. So it's like yes. you're going through a reaction to Afghan refugees, just as your character would, because you are, you are relating that through their eyes. So that's, yeah. And that does, that does keep it pretty entertaining. Do you ever, do you ever co-write? No. Well, for the one, like, there's a one-off project for the international thriller writers where MJ write, Rose right. and I wrote a, a short story together. Okay. But I don't know how to co-write if you don't plot. Like yeah. all the, I and I have friends who yeah. love it. Oh, did you? Okay. So how did that work? It, I, well, I told it was just a buddy of mine and we wanted yeah. to do dark, dark YA. And I haven't written YA before. And I don't even know how you define YA. So whether it is YA or not, I don't know, but it's except, you know, the protagonists are young. Um, we, I kind of said right at the outset, I'm like, I want to physically write this book. Um, but let's plot it together. Um, so we, we plotted about the first half and then I would feed him pages. And then after a while, I'm just like, I'm just writing this. <laughs> and I'm like, this is what I'm doing. I'm happy to rewrite anything, but just, it's, it's all coming to me. So let me just, yeah. and then he, to his credit is just a sublime editor. So he, okay. and, and it was the kind of, and this is the best part when you're co-writing with somebody like this, it's like giving it to your editor and saying, don't give me notes, just change stuff. I don't care. Just change stuff. And so yeah. it would come back to me changed. I'd be like, this is great. And I didn't have to do all this work. <laughs> so that's great. When you, especially when you can well. find that. Yeah. That, that level of cohesiveness. Yeah, I've heard horror stories. So, you know, it was, it's the first time I've done it. So, yeah. I, you know, I have no idea what's going to happen with the book. If anyone's even going to want it, my agent has it right now. But, but I think it it's was, important it was, to keep, to try new things, to do new things. That's what keeps you fresh. That's what develops your craft. And whether this book succeeds or not, all that learning and that exercise is going to make the next book better and the next book better. Yeah. So, I mean, I think one of the worst things you can do, and some people, accuse this of us of this in commercial fiction is just you, you learn how to write one book and then you just kind of keep doing it and I'm like I mean I think you have to continue to take risks and you have to stretch and you have to grow and you know it keeps us engaged it keeps us interested totally. and, and totally craft gets better all the time yeah and people are like you think of a name like John Grisham and the the immediate association is legal thriller yeah and he's got a book like painted house which has nothing yes. to do and it's one of the best books I've ever read. I'm like, this is an amazing, emotional, evocative book. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with the law. And so it's just somebody. And so I have so much respect for that. Um, you know, and people would accuse Dan Brown of saying like, well, three of your books are pretty much exactly the same. Um, but sometimes that's what, what you know as you're still figuring stuff out. And, I, and that's what appeals to you. So again, I think if you keep it just what you enjoy, and some people say, no, you got to write, you got to be thinking of your audience all the time. And and I just, I just don't because I don't know how you get through it. Yeah, and I feel like we are veering away from that. I mean, David Baldacci just had this beautiful, I'm not going to get the title off the top of my head, Coming of Age in the 80s that yeah. came out. Robert Dagoni with, what is it? the Right, well, he's all over the place. Life yeah. 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 yeah, and and we're seeing more and more authors do like one-off historic projects, like yeah. thriller writers, you know? Right, right. And, and, I, and I think editors are recognizing and publishers are recognizing readers are interested in this and it keeps yeah. writers engaged and happy. Like, you know, we really aren't meant to be robots and see right. AI will never take over the world because there's no way it can both write one of our books and a one-off coming of age historical fiction right. novels. Totally. <laughs> we and, got and this. I, th <laughs> I think that the downside of that, or at least the hard, harsh reality of that is you do have to have a certain level of, recognition and success, I think, before you can really start doing something that's fairly different because, 
because it's so tough, man, like talking to agents and just it's so hard to break in that if you told an agent you have a romance book and then you also have, you know, high concept fantasy. Yeah. That's kind of tough. Um, They they do want you to know who you want to be when you grow up first. (laughs) <laughs> and then right. you can have some indulgent hobbies. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? right. And they should, and you know, the best houses should be developing you mm-hmm. as they would an in-house employee. You know, they yeah. should, they should be nurturing your career and giving you the space and then also telling you when, you know, to make a better business decision. <laughs> well, that, well that's, said. <laughs> That feels like a good place to wrap up before we do. We're going to do a quick little storytelling of our own. This is the favorite part of it. Don't be nervous. This is, this is always a shit show. And uh, this is what uh, that's about uh, all I got in me left these days. (laughs) This is the 156th time that I've done this. So it never gets any easier. Um, So I've got three books that I chose at random off my bookshelf. You're going to choose one of those books. We're going to choose a random sentence from a random page. I'm going to read that sentence. And that'll be the first sentence in like a two to three minute long short story. So I'll read that sentence. You give me a couple sentences or whatever. I'll do a couple and then we'll, we'll kill it when we're ready. Okay. Uh, I've got uh, Claire McIntosh's A Game of Lies. Ooh, uh, I like Claire. Just came out. Brilliant book. Speaking of, Baldacci, uh, Simple Truth, classic Ooh. of his, and Darcy Coates' uh, horror thriller uh, From Below. So choose well, one of those three. I know David and Claire well, and I might have even read those books. So to be totally clean slate, let's go with Darcy. Go and Darcy. Horror. All right. So give me a page between one and 450. Uh, 112. Okay. So I'm going to quickly scan page 112. It's the ending of a chapter. Um, let's see. <laughs> All right. I mean, you do whatever you want with this. <laughs> okay. Uh, this sh- is two sentences. I'm going to read them both. Uh, okay. I'm short. The ship did not turn around for her. It didn't even slow. Oh, fun. God, now all I can think about is the Titanic. Uh-huh. So is this like the, the phone booth game? Like, so now I come up with like two sentences? Yeah. So what, what would be the next two sentences you would write after that with whatever story you... Okay. All right. The ship didn't hang out for her. The ship didn't even turn around. That's where we're at. It didn't even slow. Yep. It didn't even slow. Well, fuck that, she thought, and she got out a kayak. <laughs> <laughs> She climbed into the kayak, breathing heavily, seeing the silhouette of the ship slip into the night. It was then she realized she didn't have an oar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was mean. I like how you play this game, Carter. I can tell you're a pro at this. <laughs> this is improv. You have to accept my premise. And then she realized there was a noise from behind her and she was no longer alone. She turned, but the moonlight was soft enough that she couldn't make out anything except for vague, watery shapes. She reached her hand out slowly, and her fingertips suddenly brushed against what felt like fur. Oh, fun. That's when she realized someone left their pet bunny behind. (laughs) And she realized in her fear that she had mistaken a cute marsh bunny for a dangerous foe, but that didn't help her because the ship has still gone away and she has still a kayak with no oar. She has to think creatively, what am I going to do next? And that is when she realizes she has a bottle of sunscreen, which was going to come in hugely handy because she knew the sun would be merciless the following day. (laughs) <laughs> but she couldn't drink sunscreen. She knew her biggest problem was going to be water. So since she once camped a lot as a child, she remembered the rules of three, that she actually, the very first goal is going to be shelter. It's going to be a long night if she can't find chase down the ship. However, in this watery moonlit atmosphere that we're at shoreline, where to take cover, which is when she noticed an opening between two rocks and what could be a cave. 
Oh, I think we call it there. That was great. See, you can tell you've written a lot of books. It just, it just comes out of you. Well, now I'm going to be up all night. What happens to her? I know. I think bunny? maybe the bunny is actually a killer rabbit. And we're Monty Python. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> that is like, if you think about fears, being stranded in the water, that's w way up there for me. That is, I won't yeah. watch movies about that. Like that's just like, it horrifies me. Even in a, even in some kind of craft, like a kayak, it's just like, oh my God, that is just I can't do submarines. Stories. And my father was on a sub in the Navy. And for whatever reason, any movie, sub, I mean, granted, The Hunt for Red October is probably one of the best movies arguably ever made. Still, nope, oh, submarine, nope, it. I'm out. <laughs> wow. So you, ne you never watched Hunt for Red October? <laughs> I've made it through it in snippets. My anxiety level gets way too high because <laughs> I have climbed to claustrophobic, but I don't know. I can watch other movies. There's something about life on a sub. I just yeah. get so anxious. It's like, I yeah. can't stay on the sofa. I have to go now. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we all have our triggers. That was a great book. That was one of my, one of my favorite yeah. Clancy, early Clancy books, but yeah. well, Lisa, listen, it was great kind of connecting with you and having this lovely conversation. And uh, I wish you the best of luck uh, with your early September deadline. I have yeah. no doubt you're going to figure it out <laughs> as I'm sure you do, but it's, you still got to go through that process. Well, yeah, now she's in a cave with a kayak. I mean, this right, new book right. of mine's getting better all the time. I, yeah, if, if it comes to that, then I expect some kind of royalty. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very all right, much. Take care. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks. Bye. Bye. All right. So that's it. That is my conversation with Lisa. Um, that was, you know, I it's it's more rare than not that I have a conversation that that doesn't go through the writer's journey that we just really start talking about. Um, the art of writing and um, storytelling and the craft. And it's it's really fun for me because I just love to hear from other authors and how they do it and what their experiences are doing it. Um, and it just helps me kind of reflect on my own uh, methodologies as I go through this life as a writer. Um, please find out everything you would like to know about Lisa by going to her website at lisagardner.com. And you can pop on over to my site, carterwilson.com to see uh, my event dates, buy my books, subscribe to my newsletter, read my blog, all that good stuff. Look at other episodes of this show. And you can go on over to unboundwriter.com if you're curious about my online classes, writing retreats, or one-on-one -on -one writing coaching. So that's it, friends. As always, I really appreciate you uh, watching and or listening to this episode of Making It Up. Another episode out just next week. In the meantime, take care.